I'm joined now by Clay Johnson, author of The Information Diet. Clay, thanks so much for being with us. <laughs> now, given your background, I wanted to talk about a few things that happened about a month yeah, ago, sure. right? Specifically with SOPA and, and PIPA. Up first, where did this legislation come from? You know, what, why are we facing this now? Well, we're facing it because the content industry, the, 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 or what they call now the culture industry, um, which I find fascinating, uh, has a lot of lobbyists in Washington, D.C., ranging from the MPAA to the RIAA, who uh, I think honestly believe that they create a lot of jobs. These aren't evil people, right? I mean, this is the thing that I think we we run into a lot in Washington as we get into this idea that like there are good, there's like the forces of good and there's the forces of evil, right? And so Chris Dodd, the head of the MPAA, is now uh, branded by the internet as evil. And, um, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, Alexis over at Reddit is now good, right? But things don't really work that way. Uh, the MPAA hired Chris Dodd to do a job and that is to um, protect the MPA's interests to make sure that um, movies and recording stuff, music, makes the most amount of money possible. Um, and they think that the way for them to make the most amount of po money possible is to protect themselves from uh, online piracy. Right. And uh, they think that what they're doing is a noble mission for their organization. Um, the, you know, and that's why you saw so many other people sign up um, ranging from organized labor like the Teamsters Union um, to uh, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, uh, you, you know, it's really interesting. One, one thing I found very interesting is you very rarely find the Chamber of Commerce and organized labor uh, <laughs> on the same side sure. of an issue. Right. right. So now this legislation has been backburnered for now. Sure. But it's, you know, some form of it's probably going to sure. be coming up again. What, what consequences do you foresee if it actually gets passed? I mean, what's I, mean I think that there, and this is the, this is, this is the problem with that frame, right? Uh, I remember the first time I was inspired by a politician, it was by Howard Dean in 2004. And, uh, or it was, well, it was around 2002 where he said this. And he said, you know, uh, the Republicans are talking about a trillion dollar tax cut and Democrats are talking about a half a billion dollar tax cut, and what I want is for us to have a balanced budget. So I don't buy the idea that we should be talking about a tax cut at all until we figure out how we have a balanced budget, right? And I think the same frame uh, of looking at SOPA and saying, well, uh, there's SOPA and it exists and, and it got back burning, but there's gonna be something else that comes up, therefore we should go on the defense uh, you know, and try and figure out, I feel like that's a bad political frame to look at things mm -hmm. in. What we should be doing is trying to figure out what the right solutions are. Um, and I think for internet people uh, in particular, that's uh, going on the offensive, ensuring that we have smart, decent uh, copyright laws, maybe doing some patent reform and trying to figure out like how we can get ourselves out of the patent quagmire that we're in now. Uh, and um, you know various other things like that. Instead of trying to figure out how we're gonna compromise on SOPA, Let's actually develop our own legislation and uh, deliver that to Congress. Right. Now, during the blackout, the silver blackout on January 18th, you had a Be a Better Activist Day. What did that yield? What did you get from that? There's a few things I learned that day. The most impressive thing is I interviewed um, everybody ranging from professional Republican lobbyists to Hill staffers to people who are uh, professional activist trainers to, um, and they're all up on informationdiet.com. But the the two interviews that I got the most out of, one was uh, the Republican lobbyist, guy Andrew Stone. Um, and the thing that he really uh, taught me was that in order to move the system, you've got to be dispassionate about the system. So uh, he is more effective than an activist because instead of being charged up, fired up, and ready to go, um, he's, he, it's a job to him. Moving Congress is a job to him, right? And so he goes, uh, okay, well, I'm here to lobby for the Net Coalition. My job is to stop this SOPA legislation. Uh, what are the levers I need to pull in order to stop this SOPA legislation, right? And uh, it's not whether or not he believes in SOPA or doesn't believe in SOPA. Right. Um, his his uh, idea of success is based on his client's wishes. And I think that's what makes lobbyists far more effective than uh, a, a sort of citizen activist. And part of the reason why 
I think is because ire doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And when we're char charged up sure. and angry about something, our first instinct, uh, one thing that we do is call Congress and scream at them. Um, and that idea that that's effective is plainly incorrect because Congress pays more attention to the polls than, than we do. So they know very well that they have an 8% approval rating. They know that there are, you know, uh, 92 people in America that hate them for every eight people that like them. Sure. Uh, and so, uh, so they're fine with people screaming at them because they also know that they have uh, an 85% retention rate for incumbency. Sure. Uh, you know, you can hate all you want. As long as you don't yeah, throw right. people out, it doesn't right. really matter. Right. Um, and so, uh, so that ire doesn't actually move Congress or, or make things happen. The third thing, actually, that I found really interesting was um, that there are an average of two uh, people for every office um, that are uh, answering the phones, reading the emails, reading the mails, and uh, basically in charge of listening for that office. Uh, and if you think about the volume of calls that went in mm -hmm. um, and you sort of multiply out how much time it takes, let's say it takes a minute to receive and process every message that goes into Congress, no matter what it is. Right. Um, you're talking the maximum capacity for every office is, is uh, like a grand total of uh, 96,000 messages a day is the maximum capacity Congress can take. Yeah. Um, so maybe it's time for us to start worrying about how we can improve that capacity and make more sense out of that volume. That's, a yeah. lot of the work I do with expert labs is, is around that, is how do we build better listening tools rather than better uh, uh, megaphones. So last question for you, shifting mm -hmm. gears a little bit. You've got a session here at TOC titled, Is Search Engine Optimization Killing America? I think you win for mm -hmm. best title of the, of the show. So how is SEO harmful? Well, I think if we develop systems where the only, if the only thing that media is doing is trying to figure out what people are searching for and writing to what people are searching for, we lose a good substantial portion of democratic health because no one's searching for the Pentagon Papers, right? No one's searching for, uh, for the, the old Downing Street memo, right? Sure, right. Uh, people are searching for kittens and Kardashians, sure, but that's not really what this argument's about. It's more like people are searching for affirmation. People want to be told that they're right. And if we're constantly told that we're right, then we're, we will lose our ability to change our minds. Physiologically, from a neuroscientific point of view, the sort of the more your brain wires towards a certain opinion, the harder it is for you to see another opinion. And when democracy starts losing its ability to synthesize, uh, it loses its ability to be pragmatic. If it loses its ability to be pragmatic, it loses its ability to survive. Hmm. Um, and so uh, I think, uh, is SEO killing America? It's a little, it's, uh, I picked that headline because it's, uh, for the irony's sake, it's sort of sure. an inside joke for the readers of my book. Um, but uh, uh, the idea here is, you know, this, it, it, it actually reminds me a lot of Strata, right? Like the Strata conference, what people are going to be talking about is big data and how we can use big data analytics to give the customer more of what they want. Um, but sometimes, especially in the world of the information consumption and media, that's not the right thing to do. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, Appreciate it was great to be here. Time. Great.